This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. For everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level, you came to the right place. I'm your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of China, co-founder of the Manor Companion Graded Reader Series. And right now, my desire to stay well-informed is at odds with my desire to stay sane. My co-host is John Passon, co-founder of Mandarin Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese Grammar Wiki, Sinosplice.com, and whenever he gets a stack of resumes, he immediately just throws half of them in the garbage. He does not like unlucky people working for him. This is the fourth episode in a four-part series about learning how to read Chinese. So you've got some decent Chinese under your belt, you've read all the greater readers and learner content out there, what now? We'll talk about what to do next and how to bridge the gap to native-level content. Guest interview is with Matt Sheehan, China correspondent, author, ultimate frisbee player, and all-around cool guy. All this and more, let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Jared Turner coming at you from Utah in the United States. Hey guys, I'm John Pasden in Shanghai, China. All right, Johnny, this is part four of Learning to Read in Chinese. Before we kick into today's episode... We have a few reviews, and I'm going to go ahead and kick into the first one. This comes from Ms. Fitzgerald, and he, she says, nothing else like it. English-speaking Chinese learners have so many books, apps, videos, and other tools to help us along our journey. As an adult learning Chinese on my own, I feel really fortunate to have so many resources to help me as I study. But John and Jared offer something totally unique with the You Can Learn Chinese podcast, constant inspiration. Oh, yeah. After literally every episode, I feel more motivated to study and more connected to other people tackling this fun but difficult language. The rants and raves often turn me on to new learning resources and sometimes just make me laugh. Hey, John, someone finds you funny. But what I love most are the interviews, each of which reveal just how many different paths there are to learning this amazing language, imparting lots of great advice along the way. I bet it'll be modest and chalk it up to great editing or something, but Jared is a fantastic interviewer. Oh, shucks. Really bringing out the best in his guests, even his wife, in the most recent episode. I, I, I gotta say, she was pretty good. If you're going to spend any time at all reflecting on the best way you can learn Chinese, start here. Hey, well, thanks so much, Miss Fukudega. We really appreciate your review. Okay, so I have one from Jake Gaojian in the USA via Apple Podcasts, and he says, Amazing podcast. This podcast is the perfect complement to your weekly study routine. John and Jared are amazing hosts. The interviews are awesome, and there is just so many great things to explore and extract from the show notes every week. A must listen for anyone looking to learn Chinese. Keep it up, guys, and thanks for all your hard work. You're welcome, Jake. All right, and then, John, I got an email from a teacher I mentioned last episode. It's uh, Pan Xiaofeng, or Pan Lao Shi. She talked to her students, and they gave us a whole bunch of like really great feedback. So Corey says, I highly enjoyed listening to the podcast and you made it fun to listen to. I hope to learn more Chinese to go there someday. All right, Corey, keep it up. Rose says, your podcast makes learning Chinese seem less intimidating. Thank you. Raquel says, from your podcast, I not only learned more about the Chinese language, but about Chinese culture too. Thank you. Oh, shucks. And Christy says, super interesting listen about the culture and language. It makes me even more interested whenever the homework's a podcast. It's fun. Oh, yes, it is. And today I'm going to wrap up with this last one from Cora. Listening to these podcasts give me a better sense on skills and techniques needed to learn Chinese efficiently. This podcast is definitely opened my mind to different ways and tactics to learn Chinese. Can't wait to hear more from you and your personal experiences. Well, thanks, Cora. We appreciate that. And uh, to the entire class of Pan Lao Shi, thanks for your feedback. We appreciate it. Okay, so I have one other review. This one is from Adi. It's an email. And he says, hi to both of you. First, I would like to thank you. The podcast is very real, not trying to hide the difficulties and problems of learning Chinese. Personally, I feel that's very helpful because it calms the frustrations you can go through while learning the new language. Yes, I agree. My name is Adi. I've been living in China for around two years. I passed HSK4 a few months ago. By this point, I always thought that my level would be much higher. But to be honest, I feel my level of speaking and listening to real life situations is much lower. On the other hand, I can read and write quite well. I read all your books, and it is not a big effort to read them again and recognize all the characters. Because you don't have other books, I tried to find myself other things for reading, such as comic books. 
but I found a big problem. It is difficult for me to identify when those characters represent an actual character of the comic and when it's just a new word. Do you have any trick mm. to help me out to identify those personal names? Or should I just go for other graded reader collections? Thanks a lot, Adi. Okay, so that's a good question. And we kind of anticipated this problem when we created our graded readers, right? We have yep. the section in the beginning of every book that lists out all the main characters and their names. And then in the book, we use a gray underline to remind you that that's a proper noun, a character name. I once interviewed a friend named Zach, who's a big fan of Marvel Comics in Chinese. And I noticed that that book even has the same thing. It's a list of characters with their Chinese names. The Chinese names are pretty weird in Chinese, even if they're not that weird in English. So that's helpful. Even if your comic book or book doesn't have that, it might help to do some research and just look up, you know, figure out the character names before you really start reading. Yeah, that's quite helpful. Yeah, because we've all been there where you spend like five minutes trying to figure out the grammar of the sentence. Like, oh, that's their name. And then, you know, smack your forehead. Like, <laughs> You kind of ha have to go through that. Um, we've all been there. But yeah, doing a little bit of research on the names, especially if it's a translated work, it's going to help. Exactly. So Adi was trying to read comic books because he was trying to read something that had visual cues while also harder than our graded readers. So he chose comic books, and that's, that's not a bad choice. But what Adi is finding, I think, is what many learners of Chinese are finding when they hit the intermediate level and maybe upper intermediate, which is it's really hard to find native materials in Chinese that you can read as an intermediate or an upper intermediate learner. So this series on how to learn to read Chinese, we started with pinyin characters and vocabulary. Part two is baby steps to real reading. Part three was developing fluency now. And part four is today, bridging the gap to native materials. And in case you're wondering, the gap is very real and it's big and it's something you really have to deal with. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is something that we hear from learners all the time. We get emails about this. You know, I've read all the greater readers in your series and the other series out there, and now I have nothing left. What do I do? And I think this is a challenge, John, specifically with Chinese, because we know the unique nature of characters. You can't just decode it if you don't know the character. You can't just you know sound it out. And also, this whole area is a little bit underdeveloped from Chinese, where if you were learning English as a second language, oh, there's tons of stuff out there. But we just have a lack of resources here in Chinese. Yeah. And before we get into all this other stuff, I do want to mention one thing about graded readers, specifically Mandarin Companions graded readers. People keep asking us, what are you going to do level three? Why aren't there more level two? And those are good questions. But one of the reasons why it's taking so long is to do a good level two, you need more level ones because every level one you do like helps build a foundation and makes the picture of what you need at level two clearer. Because, you know, we're not following someone else's standard. We're building our own. And data collection is really important. And it's not just data of Chinese newspapers or something like that. It's actually the data from our own books. So we need more level ones to do a good job with level two. And so right now, the situation which we're at is we need more level twos to do a good job with level three. So more level twos are coming. And in fact, we've already identified quite a few level three stories that we want to do. So they're coming. Oh, yeah. They're coming. Okay, so let's get into the main topic. And as Jared mentioned, there are not a ton of great materials out there right now for people learning Chinese and trying to bridge this gap to, to native materials. Uh, a lot of the efforts right now for producing new and better materials are focused on beginners. And I think that's the right choice, but it is frustrating for people who are trying to go through this gap on their own. I think when you look at this problem, it's helpful to think of one of those MBA quadrant graphs. You know what I'm talking about, right, Jared? Call it two by two. The two by two. Okay. So you can think of like like the X axis being pain threshold. And uh, we've talked before <laughs> about uh, reading pain. So you know what this is, right? Yo, we all do. Right. So there's too much vocabulary that you don't know. There's too much that you don't understand. And you're just like staring at one sentence for like 10 minutes, right? So that's reading pain. So your pain threshold is an issue. And then your interest threshold is an issue, which means mm -hmm. how much can you stand reading something which is the right level, but it's not interesting at all. And ideally, it would be neither painful nor uninteresting. Like it's interesting and just hard enough that I plus one sweet spot but in reality, because there are so few materials, often it feels like you have to make a choice between 
a little more pain or a little more boring in terms of material. And I think a lot of people who just kind of brute force their way th across this gap, they, they choose pain. They're just like, I don't care how hard it is. I'm going to use my dictionary. I'm going to going to use Pleco. And if I just keep plugging away, I'm going to get it eventually. And it's true that works, but it is painful and it's not for everybody. In fact, some people might give up before they make it. Well, that's really good, John. And something, though, I have seen in all the interviews that I've done for this podcast is how important that motivation can be and your interest in, in whatever it is you're reading. And this is a guiding principle that if it's you have something that you're really interested in, you can work through that pain. What's really hard is when you have something that is just not interesting to you at all. And it's just difficult. I mean, and that is just it's dry. Imagine like trying to read a technical manual in your native language. I mean, that's probably pretty dry. It's not enjoyable. But now trying to do that like in Chinese, it's not going to be that interesting. But if you have a story or a topic that you are genuinely interested in and you really want to learn about and you really want to read, that can see you through some of these difficult stages. So I think that's one of the first tips I would give to people when you're trying to bridge that gap. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you're going to deal with pain, it better be worth it, right? It's got to be interesting. On the other hand, if it's not painful, but it's boring, that's kind of the situation that a lot of us have in school, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you go to some advanced Chinese class, you don't get to choose what you read. The teacher's like, everybody has to read this. And it's boring, but that's what you got to read. And if you just keep doing that, you are going to improve your Chinese. So maybe you have this motivation related to passing the class and getting a, a decent grade. But for people that aren't in school, that might not be the best way. You know, this is something we're really cognizant of with Manor Companion and what we do with our graded readers. And you know me, John. I'm so anal about the story, right? I'm like, no, this part it misses the point or, you know, this isn't interesting or this isn't fun. This falls flat, right? It's like it's got to be a good story. That's super important. Right. Unfortunately, a lot of people will have to choose between these two. So you might go with boring because it's part of the class or there's some other reason that it's actually worth reading. Like maybe you want the HSK and all this stuff is boring, but you want that HSK certificate, so you're willing to do it. I think for me, what helped me bridge the gap the most was I got a job translating news, short articles, so they weren't too long. I've never really enjoyed reading the news, and I think that's especially true for Chinese. So this is work that I did not enjoy. I was doing it for the money, but it actually really did help my Chinese. So that was not interesting, and it was painful. <laughs> so that was like the worst. <laughs> but you had monetary incentive to do so. <laughs> yes. But I think news is a special topic when we get to talking about how to bridge the gap. Because for a lot of people, reading a newspaper or reading a news site is like this goal they have. And the problem with news is if you don't actually like reading the news, like in English, then why would you think you're going to like reading it in Chinese? I can tell mm -hmm. you it's not magically interesting because it's Chinese. And in fact, mm -hmm. if you're reading mainland China's news, there are a lot of reasons why you might find it even less interesting than yep. other forms of news. Can we say censorship? <laughs> Maybe Taiwan, <laughs> if you're reading traditional, it might be more interesting. I do hear that a lot. But there are other problems with the news, though. And I wanted to point that out because if you've been trying to like brute force your way into being able to read the news, there are some issues that you need to be aware of. So one of them relates to the question we had at the beginning of the podcast, like how can you recognize people's names? Uh, when you're reading news articles, there are going to be plenty of people's names, plenty of government agency names, plenty of company names, all kinds of proper nouns that you've never encountered before. And that can be super frustrating. And the annoying yeah. thing about it, too, is that a lot of times you're not going to see them again anytime soon. So it's not like you're building up this vocabulary of names. I think something on this angle for a lot of people who are thinking, oh, I want to read the newspaper, I might suggest that you know, if this is something that you have a real goal to do, I can suggest that you take a look at magazines. I had a friend back in Shanghai where he was really interested in like military stuff. And so one of the things he did is he got these uh, magazines. They're all about guns and tanks and military stuff. And that's what he read. <laughs> okay, so that's focused on one topic, right? The problem with the news yeah. is if you're going from like headlines to finance to sports, like unless you stay really focused on one topic, which you can do if you're, if you're reading news online, you're being exposed to so many different words and you're not sure which ones are common and which are uncommon. 
If you're adding like every one of those into some kind of flashcard deck, like, oh, that's kind of a recipe for disaster. So I think something we can take away from this, John, is that one thing to do when you're trying to bridge this gap is boil it down and in, perhaps into a topic or a specific interest area. Because if you're doing that and you're reading articles or it could be news or magazines or whatever it is, if you are focusing on an interest or area or a topic of interest, something like that, you will start to see that repetition. Even if there are specialty characters and words that are used for it, you're going to start seeing them again and again. And that's going to help you to start get a little more traction to moving towards independent reading. The absolute worst would be the opposite of that, which is reading totally different news articles in a random way. I mean, you're just not going to get the repetition. And we should also mention here, there's a website called The Chairman's Bow, which is pretty good. It levels the news, simplifies it to lower levels. But I should mention that it does have a little bit of this problem because it's the news, right? Because it's the mm -hmm. news and you never know what's going to be in the headlines the next day. There's just a lot of unexpected vocabulary just popping out at you. So yeah, like Jared was saying, having a focus really helps enable you to feel that progress. Yeah, quite so. One other thing related to news, I've worked with a lot of people who are trying to bridge this gap. A lot of them will use Google Translate. So they'll copy the article, put it into Google Translate, and I'll look at the English, look at the pinyin. That is actually especially good for dealing with those proper nouns, especially if you just couldn't figure it out. Google Translate has a ton of famous people names, politicians, place names. It's all in Google Translate. It's great. Problem is, if you get used to using Google Translate and you're not actually trying to read the material on your own, you might sort of fall into the self-deception of thinking that you can read this stuff, but you really need Google Translate. So there are other ways that you can do this which are better. One that I recommend to all my clients at All Set Learning is the Playco Clipboard Reader. So if you're reading anything mm. on your phone, or it's in WeChat or on a news site or any text, you copy it, and then you go into the Pleco clipboard reader, and then it's all there in Chinese, but then you can tap on the words, and you can see the pinyin or the English. You know, but John, I got to take it one step further, because if you have an Android device, it gets even better with that Pleco because it has the optical reader. For the Apple devices, you can use your camera and point it at something, and it'll kind of like recognize characters. But if you have an Android, it actually has a screen reader, and it's an overlay, and it'll optically read whatever is on your screen. And uh, you can then touch on the characters and get some pop-ups. So that can also be a great assist if you have some articles or whatever you're reading. You can even do that with novels. So if you're reading something in the Kindle app, you can use that overlay and you can have that available for pop-ups if you come across things you don't know. Okay, but using Google Translate, that can help you figure out what something means, but you're not really learning that much. Okay, so I feel like we've jumped right into news because news is kind of a special topic that needs attention if you're talking about bridging the gap to native materials. But what I'd like to do now is walk us through a little bit how someone might do this. And I'll have a couple different options, but I feel like there's a fairly clear ideal progression that we want to follow. Mm -hmm. I broke it down into 10 steps. So the first step is learning pinyin. We already talked about that. That was in our first podcast in the series. Second one is learning characters, also in the first one. Number three is you start reading early. We talked about baby steps to real reading and we also talked about developing fluency now. You don't wait until you have 2,000 characters to start reading. No. Start reading early. Yes. So step four is uh, read graded readers. Uh, hopefully you're, you're on that train. This is definitely helpful. You don't read just one. You read a bunch. Okay. Now we're getting into less familiar territory. This is where a lot of people run into trouble when they get through the graded readers they can find. So step five is read selections or comics. Now, when I say selections, I mean, you don't try to read an entire article. You just take like the first paragraph. And this can be hard for people to do because they feel like they need to read the entire article. But for a lot of things, including news, the first article is actually a nice self-contained unit if you pull it out of the article and just forget about the rest of the article. Like give yourself a smaller victory. I do this with my clients. I've done this on my own. It can be really useful. Comics are another option here. You have to find a comic that's not too difficult, but because there's relatively little text, right? You really need to find something shorter that you can focus on because there may be a bit of pain here. And let's not prolong the pain. Let's let's give ourselves a break and make it a little shorter. Don't hurt me, John. I don't, not too much pain, please. Yeah, well, don't do it to yourself, man. That's the, that's the point. I'm not doing it. 
<laughs> okay, so part six. No self-harming here, guys. Yes. Part six, read a text which has accompanying audio. Mm. We've mentioned this before. This can be super useful. Maybe the text is a little bit above your, your level and either you try to read it and then you play the audio or you read it while you're listening to the audio or like you read it first with the audio and then you read it on your own. There are lots of different ways you can do this, but it kind of feels like cheating, but it's okay because you're not going to find that many texts with audio. So you might want to take what you can get and give it a try if you're struggling to bridge this gap. Side note, we do have the audiobooks out for Manor Companion novels. Hey, hey. All of them? Level two is under review, but it's done. It's uploaded, so it'll probably be about another month before it's finally approved and out. Okay, soon to be all of them. All right, number seven. This is where it starts getting a little bit harder, but you want to either find short stories or short articles or possibly short books for kids. But, you know, we've said this before. A lot of Chinese kids' books are super hard, so... You can't count on a kid's book being easy. Some of them are okay, but definitely not all of them. Often, if you can find a short story that you really want to read or a short article on a topic that you're really interested in, that will be even better. There's probably going to be some pain, but it's got to be fairly short. And as long as the interest is there, you can get through it. For sure. One little example I want to give here is the short story, Kuang Ren Ji, so The Diary of a Madman. It's pretty short, definitely not easy, so it's not something I would recommend if you just got to the intermediate level, but I found it surprisingly doable when I did read it, and it really opened my eyes to the fact that some short fiction can be quite approachable at this level. Next one, number eight, read short nonfiction or kids stuff. Mm -hmm. So we might be talking about, you know, entire books here, but short ones. You know, I think it's good to really delineate here about kids books versus even like early reading stuff. So these are materials that Chinese kids are going to be reading themselves, not something that parents or adults are going to be reading to kids. Okay. So it's very different in here. And I was exposed to a lot of these when my kids were in Chinese school back in Shanghai. And there are some great series out there. Uh, one, John, I really like. It's a uh, Fei Chang Xiaozi Ma Ming Jia. And it's about this little boy and his little antics at school. It's hilarious. And it's actually pretty easy to read. It's like second grade kids can read them. And there's a whole bunch of series. One I did like, John, I think is relatively easy to read. It's Diary of a Wimpy Kid in Chinese. There's obviously specialty words, but it was actually pretty easy to read. Yeah. And there's actually another Chinese one. I feel like it's a copy of Diary of a Wimpy Kid, but it's called Mi Xiao Quan. And it's about this girl that's in elementary school. So pretty similar and also fairly easy to read. So there's a lot of good stuff out there. But once again, it's it's a little more like juvenile novels as opposed to like kids books. Right. So number eight, I said short nonfiction. So this is stuff you're familiar with or super interested in or kid stuff. And the reason I say nonfiction for number eight is because it's a lot easier than fiction. Oh, yeah. A lot of fiction is just so flowery. Novels, it can be so hard. And that's... Partly a function of the writer's style. So there are some writers you want to stay away from because they're just too hard. You want to find like the Hemingway of Chinese. You don't want to find the, uh, I don't know, James Joyce of Chinese, right? Oh, no. (laughs) Or the Dickens of Chinese. Okay, so number nine is reading short novels. So like I just said, you want to stay away from the hard stuff, but you should be able to find short novels in Chinese, which you're interested in and are not crazy hard. You are going to want to do your research to make sure you don't pick up something too hard. Um, I should mention that a lot of people I know, including my clients and also people in the, the You Can Learn Chinese WeChat group, are looking at Santi, uh, the three-body problem, the sci-fi novel, mm-hmm. as a first book. Which is an excellent book. I read that in English. But it's not a good first novel in Chinese because Ooh. it's too long. Talking about some advanced physics. It's not super hard. It, actually. Advanced physics, if you know it in English, is not that hard in Chinese, Yeah, but it's also not the easiest. But the other thing is it's just too long. It's too long. Don't give yourself a novel that's really long. Like I know some of you out there are probably like me and you hate to give up halfway through a novel. I hate that, Like even if it's terrible. If that's you, do not read Chinese novels that are super long. Just don't do it. And I want to remind you that if a book looks not too bad, kind of long, but not too bad. And it's in Chinese. The Chinese is actually denser than the English. So it's going to be longer than you think. 
That's true. I think roughly it's about uh, Chinese books. They're about two thirds. It's just easy to underestimate how long a Chinese book really is. So keep that in mind. Chinese characters simply take up less space and they actually hold more information. So it takes more English words to convey the same amount of information in a string of Chinese characters. That was number nine. Number 10 is reading longer novels or nonfiction. So this is where like something like Santi would come in. Eventually, you'll get to the, the more difficult writers if you really want to. John, I'm going to say one little caveat on that is I do know that some of the nonfiction stuff also can be difficult. But I think that's just a nature of the language. I've got these books. It's called Iwan Weishima, 10,000 Wise, and they're you know, questions for kids about science and earth and things like that. It can be really hard because you're introducing maybe some concepts and stuff in there. But when we are dealing with facts, it can be a little more straightforward. But I think it's just underscoring, hey, when we're bridging the gap, it can just be difficult, period, right? It's just because Chinese, it's much more challenging to learn to read the language and it can be a difficult thing to do. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. Nonfiction can be really hard. If, if you don't know anything about the topic, then <laughs> don't try to read it in Chinese. Or if, if you just take a look at what the nonfiction book is about, you might realize that it's not that hard. For example, there's that book, The Tipping Point, and it has like a bunch of little stories in it. Like Malcolm Gladwell oh, likes yeah. to Malcolm write Gladwell. little stories. Yeah, he likes to write little stories to illustrate his point. So those little stories are not super literary. They're pretty easy. Um, like that is a pretty easy nonfiction book. It's not going to be the same if you try to read Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time, right? In Chinese, <laughs> maybe yeah. don't do that. Yeah. I was talking earlier about that quadrant graph with a pain threshold and an interest threshold, and then these 10 steps that can get you towards bridging the gap for non-native materials. Uh, I have these summed up in a blog post uh, on All Set Learning, so if you want to check that out, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. You know, John, something I think that's good to mention here is that there's a reason why this is the last step. We're not talking like, okay, just start learning characters and then try to bridge to this native material. The key thing behind this is that you are building a base. You're building a understanding of the language. And so hopefully you can be at an intermediate or an upper intermediate level before you're trying to bridge this gap. But if you're trying to bridge this gap at an intermediate level or upper intermediate level, it's much easier to do than if you are at like an elementary or even a beginner level because you have so much more to work with. That even if it's a text that's technical or fiction and it's something very literary, well, the point is, is that you are going to have a base understanding of a lot of these common characters that are already existing in just natural occurring Chinese. And so it's much easier to bridge that gap. And one thing I referenced, John, is our interview we had with Terry Waltz uh, in a number of episodes ago. Uh, she talked about this, how she was trying to do translation material, like about specific industries, things around concrete industry, and things like that. But she already had achieved a proficient level of Chinese. And even though she didn't know everything, it was much easier for her to tackle these specialty words and concepts because she already had a, a solid grasp of the language. So this is really important that you work your way up to this and you don't try to make that jump too early because it's going to be more challenging if you do. But if you wait till you get a higher level proficiency, you're going to be able to tackle this much better. And then you're going to be on your way to higher levels of Chinese. I myself didn't really try to start bridging this gap until I was probably studying for about four years, two of which were in China. And so you don't have to be, you know, the same as me. Everyone's different. And when Jared talks about building a foundation, I hope you understand that means your foundation. Like you don't need to mm -hmm. build the foundation that everyone has to have. You have to build the HSK6 foundation. Like, no, you don't. If you want to read something, you want to read something that's interesting, you got to build your foundation that enables you to do that, that strengthens your motivation, that keeps you going. And uh, sometimes you got to just say, you know, I don't care about HSK because I'm reading books now and I left all that behind. Ultimately, when you're out there using your language skills, nobody's going to care about any certificate you have or they're going to care about what your degree is in this or that. They're going to care whether or not they can understand you and whether or not you can communicate. So make sure you keep your focus on that. Jiao, you can learn Chinese, including reading and bridging the gap to native level materials. Oh yeah, totally can. Now it's time for a word from our sponsor. And John, today our sponsor is All Set Learning. Oh yeah. Boring Bangong Shi, a comic for intermediate learners of Chinese focused on office life. Wait, John, you mean there's a comic out there for 
Chinese learners? There is. <laughs> wow. And it's intermediate level, not beginner level. That's amazing. What is it about? It's about office life. It's kind of like Dilbert. It's all in Chinese. And just like our graded readers where there's like new words at the bottom of the page, each comic has some vocabulary at the bottom. So if you're intermediate, especially if you have any kind of contact with like a Chinese office environment, you may find it useful. Even if you don't, you may find it refreshing to be able to read a comic that is actually not very difficult. That's amazing. Where can I find this amazing comic? Allsetlearning.com. All right. I'm going to go check it out right now. All right. All right. Now it's time for rants and raves. John, what do you got for us today? You got a rant or you got a rave? I have a rave. And my rave is kind of weird, but you know, when I was prepping for this podcast, I was reminded of uh, how much I've enjoyed the Chinese writer Lu Xun, specifically Kuang Ren Ri Ji, A Madman's Diary. It's from 1918, but it's a classic. And one of the reasons I think he's worth mentioning, uh, Lu Xun, this, uh, this author, is that he's a super important person in Chinese history, but he's also someone that all Chinese people that grow up in mainland China have to read. And as a result, many of them end up hating him, <laughs> like, especially like people <laughs> in their 20s and 30s. If I try to talk to them about Lu Xun, I'm like, oh, I like Lu Xun. They're like, are you kidding me? Like, this conversation's over. We're not talking about him. I guess school is just cruel when it comes to having to learn that stuff. But I found him really interesting. And, you know, all his stuff has been translated into English. So there's Diary of a Madman, a.k.a. A Madman's Diary. Kong Yi Ji is another really good one. And uh, Medicine, Yao. Anyway, I think it's great. His stuff has real depth, and it's not that hard if you ever start bridging the gap into literature. That's great. All right, so what do you got, Jared? Rant or rave? Okay, John, I also have a rave today. And today my rave is brought to you by wordwall.net. This is a pretty cool website. It's called wordwall.net. And it's an educational game website. This is, I think, a great alternative to something like flashcards. What you can do is you can take like character lists or a word list or phrases or something, and you can put them in to this and you can like create games out of them. And this is something actually my wife, Heather, just uh, showed me recently. and She created a bunch of stuff for her kids, and it's actually pretty fun. There's already a lot of existing Chinese games on this with like Chinese characters, but you can actually take your own set and you can put it in there. And it's just like it, it'll takes word sets and puts it into a game. So it gamifies it really quick. And you can even take that same set and turn it into another game and stuff. So it's actually really cool. I've played some of her games. I got kind of addicted on them too. And I'm actually like competing against her students. And so I'm like, I'm going to number one on all of these. <laughs> so the games are all online. They're not things that you print out. Nothing that you print out. They're all online. And so like as there's matching games, there's this one thing she set up where it's got like a train and there's balloons flying over the train and, and on every balloon is suspended a character and you got to pop the balloon and try to get the character to drop into the train car that has the right <laughs> character or the image that matches the, the character. Anyway. Wow, balloon popping. I, I'm telling you, man, I like I got the high score on that one, you know. Actually, I, I kind of stopped after a while because just I kept beating the whole thing and it kept going on and on. I was like, all right. Don't invite Jared to your child's birthday party. He likes to pop balloons. <laughs> you can go check it out. It's wordwall.net. And one thing, too, is also with our Manor Companion, we have the word list for all of our books that's on our website at mannercompanion.com. So you click on a book and you can find the word list. You could even take some of those word lists and characters that you're still learning you can put them into here and you can play some games with it. All right. So, John, I'm tired of you playing games with me. <laughs> okay, then go interview somebody. Fine, I'll do it. So, my name is Matt Sheehan. I lived in China 2010 to 2016. I was first introduced to Matt by an associate, and I'm sure glad he did. Spent a lot of time, a lot of energy trying to learn Chinese while I was there. Got it up to, I think, a you know a pretty good level such that I could work and, and do interviews in it because I was a journalist there towards the end. Matt is a great example of someone who worked hard to learn Chinese and then leveraged that to make his own breaks in the world. Something else I appreciate about him is how his journey changed his worldview. Came back to the U.S. in 2016, and right now I work at a think tank called Macro Polo, where I analyze the China-U.S. technology relationship. You're going to like his story. Even the part about him pooping in a bag. Yes, that happened. Stay with us. 
Okay, Matt, why did you start learning Chinese? I first landed in Beijing in the summer of 2008. I was a camp counselor at an academic camp, basically, in like the hutongs around Beijing. I was just instantly totally taken with the country. And, you know, my window into it was so small. This is pre-smartphones. I When I landed there, I knew mm. essentially nothing about Chinese history. I don't know. The world around me was so stimulating. The, the cars, the bustle, the people, everything like that. And so I started trying to be friends with the Balan of my local building, the two security guards there and, you know, communicating through whatever hand gestures. And I taught them <laughs> how to throw a Frisbee and they gave me their Balan shirt. No way. <laughs> and right then I knew, you know, okay, I want to come back to this country. And when I come back, I want to speak Chinese. I want to learn Chinese. So that was the start. Well, Matt, I, I want to hear a little more about this. How did this opportunity come about to say, hey, I'm going to go to China? This is the summer between my sophomore year and my junior year. I was like, you know what? I want to go like travel around Asia. I think maybe I'd taken a seminar on like Buddhism in Bhutan or something like that. I, I went to Stanford for undergrad and there's like academic summer camps there. And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. you know, I want a job as a camp counselor. I want to make money and then use the second half of the summer to go to China. So I was interviewing for a job as just a camp counselor, like on Stanford campus. And I was like, yeah, but I can only do the first half of the summer because I want to go to Asia after that. And they're like, well, would you like to go to China and be a camp counselor there and pay you to be there and pay for your travel and everything? <laughs> I was like, yes, that is definitely what I want to do. Sounds like so a good deal. <laughs> ended up in Beijing in the Hutongs just west of Hohai. I had like six weeks kind of in the center of the city working. Then I had about two weeks of traveling. I went to Xi'an. I went to Shanghai. I remember sitting in the airport terminal in Shanghai, like waiting for my flight back to the U.S. and already seeing myself like, I need to get back here. Like when I graduate, I'm coming back for sure. What do you think was it? I mean, you kind of put in a point on it. Is there anything that you can say like, this is something that really like captured my interest? Yeah, I think it was kind of the energy at like the street level. So prior to that, I think I, I would have thought of myself as someone who was like well-traveled. My family, we have like my grandma lived in Italy. And so we'd go to Europe, travel country to country, et cetera, et cetera. And so I thought, you know, okay, yeah, I've kind of got like a vision of the world and what it looks like. But as soon as I landed in Beijing and just, you know, <laughs> stepping out into the middle of traffic and the the, the hawkers and the cars and the... It like rocks your world, right? <laughs> yeah, just all the like ground level chaos over there, I just found super fascinating. And, you know, my ideas about all that matured over time. And I learned that most of what I was thinking was interesting is I was totally wrong about it and it was foolishness or whatever, but the, the country kind of kept being interesting to me, so... When I tried to like for the first time put a point on it and say what it was that was grabbing me was like any question that I'd thought about in economics, you know, philosophy, family, just psychology, like any one of these questions that I was taking like university classes on. And I thought, oh, you know, I've, I've got a good sort of handle around this question. It was like China would just kind of take that and turn it on its head. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of just realized how much of what I thought I knew and felt about the world was like predicated on this very kind of simple, clean life that I lived in, you know, the California suburbs at Stanford, you know, I was taking all these classes. I thought I was like learning about the world and learning about philosophy, but I was in a kind of a narrow groove. And China was the first thing that kind of shook that and made me realize like how kind of contingent on all these other things that worldview was. I love that feeling. So when you got back to Stanford, you said, I want to come back here. Is that when you made that decision to say, hey, I'm really going to start learning Chinese? And what did you do? I mean, I wanted to start learning Chinese right away. But actually, like after I was in Beijing, I'd already like signed up to go to Chile, to go to Santiago as my study abroad. I remember thinking to myself, maybe every country is just as interesting as China was. You know, I'm going to go to Chile and maybe that'll just be totally fascinating and will rock my world and I'll just want to be there. <laughs> I remember just going, spending, you know, 10, 12 weeks in Chile and eventually be like, no, this actually isn't, <laughs> this isn't nearly as interesting to me as, <laughs> as I thought it might be. No disrespect to Chile. And so Stanford had a system where you, you had to start the Chinese classes like at the beginning of the year. So I basically had to wait a full year, wait until my senior year to start studying Chinese. Mm. And so I took three quarters of Chinese my senior year before I left. And then I kind of learned the basics as one can learn basics in like a university class outside of the country. And then sort of took that with me to Xi'an in 2010 when I moved there. 
So, but why Xi'an? I mean, I know a lot of the opportunities can take you to the big cities. And Xi'an, okay, don't get me wrong, that is a big <laughs> city, right? But, you know, I imagine there's still a lot of people that have never heard of Xi'an who maybe even listen to this. You might say, oh, Terracotta Warriors. And like, oh, that place, you know, but what will happen there? Two things, like a little bit of choice and then also just luck. The choice side of it was I had traveled to Xi'an for, I think, like five, six days in 2008 when I was first there. And I'd gone around like the Muslim quarter Hui Minjie in Xi'an. And I just thought that was like a really, you know, fascinating other side of China that I hadn't seen at all in Beijing. And, you know, Xi'an has this reputation as like a historical capital, ancient culture and all that stuff, which, you know, does and does not carry into the modern day. I'm a guy who likes that kind of history and old school stuff. So I had been there and I had kind of good feelings about its reputation more broadly. The, the real reason I went was the language teaching certification that you can study for and get. And mm. I had just decided like, oh, I don't really want to like pay $500 to get the certification. And the first place that offered me a job without the certification was in Xi'an. So I was like, okay, that's where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> I also like to hear like any time you have like some breakthrough moments, things that really worked for you and helped you get along in your Chinese proficiency. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, the first year is kind of that like typical like roller coaster first year of language study. Like one day you've learned your 25 sentences of Chinese that you can speak and you go to the park and talk to some old person and you use like, you know, 20 of the 25 sentences and they understand you and you understand them and you just feel like you're great and you feel like you're on the you know road to success and then the next day you go out and try to like just tell like the watermelon guy you know i want two watermelons and you know and you're using like r instead of liang or something like that some stupid mistake you just cannot get past that i guess a couple things were the big breakthrough moments and maybe less on like suddenly the language clicking and more on like the motivation for it. Mm. My first month I got there, I had a job at the school and they kind of put me up in a hotel while they were supposed to like refurbish this apartment that they were going to put me and my fellow teacher into. But the renovation project somehow turned into a mess and then we're delayed and et cetera, et cetera. So basically I was kind of trapped in a hotel room for I think about a month more or oh, less. Man. Oh, a Chinese hotel room by the map. Chinese <laughs> hotel room. I'm like washing my underwear in the sink every day, <laughs> yeah. you know, because like I don't have a washing machine. And the, so <laughs> like normal Chinese life, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, finally, when we had moved into our apartment after the hotel, basically all of the appliances stopped working. We couldn't use the toilet, couldn't use the <laughs> oh, sink. No. And my manager had called and said, hey, someone's going to come and fix your sink and your toilet for you. They're going to come at this time, you know, be there. And they came in and, and I, I saw them going in there and I thought they were trying to fix the toilet. And the next thing I know, they're just using a jackhammer to jackhammer through the wall between <laughs> the kitchen and the bathroom. They jackhammered my toilet and my sink and they turned <laughs> off all water in the apartment. And like, I'm at this point, I'm still totally unable to communicate with them. So I just have these guys came in to fix everything. <laughs> they like destroy the bathroom <laughs> and the kitchen, what? walk out with my toilet, walk out with my sink. <laughs> and on their way out, like, I can't even ask them, like, when is this coming back? Like, when will yeah. I have water again? So it was kind of like total failure on the language front. And I had no running water or toilet. Store your camera, store your toilet, store your sink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what the heck? And so for about a week, you know, I had to like basically like handle my business like in bags in the kitchen. Oh, and, my gosh. Like, <laughs> it was a bad, bad situation. <laughs> and my big kind of like hope had been I was going to go to a Frisbee tournament in Wuhan. Mm -hmm. And because I connected with some people who, who played Frisbee in China, I played ultimate Frisbee and I was really excited to go to this tournament. And in like the days and weeks running up to it, just, I had kind of like bad thing after bad thing happened. So first I used to go to the park, I would be studying my textbook, but really trying to just like get into conversation with Chinese people, mm -hmm. you know, hope they see my textbook and say, Oh, Jacob Wagor ends them, you know, like mm -hmm. they suddenly yeah. want to talk. And so that had been a great success. And, and one day I did that in the park and the guy who was like my new friend, quote unquote, who was trying to study with me, tried to steal my camera, um, what? Like my little, <laughs> you know, camera taking <laughs> pictures with, I sort of like chased him down and he ditched the camera or whatever. You know, I was very upset and I was yeah, it just kind of got me in a bad place around a lot of stuff. And you shouldn't then, have tried to outrun an ultimate Frisbee player. Not a good <laughs> idea. So I bought a plane ticket to Wuhan. The police took away my passport because my school had done my visa stuff wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it was yeah. like a kind of a run of unfortunate events at which, you know, at the end of it, I'm kind of like, man, you know, this isn't all it's cracked up to be. Like, I'm sick of this place. <laughs> and I went to the tournament in Wuhan and it was my first time being like totally immersed with 
young Chinese people my age who were really excited to like hang out. Who they wanted to learn frisbee from me. I wanted to learn Chinese from them. We had play all frisbee all day Saturday. Go to this big like party where everyone gets super drunk on beer, and the Kazakh team is like dancing Kazakh dances, and you know we're carrying wow. off like one of my new friends who's like passed out, and then we play again all day Sunday. And I like hop on kind of an overnight train back to Xi'an on, on Sunday night to Monday. And when I came back from that, I was just like so energized around wanting to learn Chinese. While I was there, I had seen some other foreigners, some other Americans who'd been there a while and they were kind of teaching classes, running drills in Chinese. And I was just like, I want to be those guys. I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to really like connect with people here. It was only like a month into my time there, but it was a real turning point. And once I got back, I was like, you know, whatever, my passport thing got sorted out. No, no one else tried to like steal my camera and sort of everything smoothed out. And I was just so motivated. That sounds like a super formative experience. So like, how did uh, you get into things like you were a journalist, right? I mean, how did you get into that? And what role did Chinese play into that? So early in my time there, I had been kind of inspired by the work of some China journalists, namely Peter Hessler. I really want to be a journalist over there and to kind of tell the stories of ordinary people, my friends. And so getting into journalism is, is tough. And Chinese was a big part of that for me in that didn't have an established like journalism background. I wasn't part of a bureau. I didn't have translators and, and all the things that more established journalists have so they can kind of get plopped into China and still be very effective for me to try to compete and to like do something in that field. I had to kind of scrap it all together on my own. So in the period of time when I was kind of trying to transition into journalism, 2012, 13, 14, I would just kind of try to like send myself out into like kind of far flung places in China mm -hmm. and try to find interesting stories, interview people, read things, et cetera, et cetera, in Chinese language, which was like a barrier for a lot of other people. And I would try to use the fact that I could speak, read, understand, et cetera, in Chinese as my little, you know, bit of an edge to try to like get that story before, you know, some other outlet did. If it's an established journalist, but they have to wait for their you know, their assistants or their translators to kind of go through something and tell them what it means, then that's a little bit of an edge for me. So I was a journalist over there reporting for about two years and, you know, I'd use it every single day on the job. I'd do all my interviews in Chinese, read Chinese documents, et cetera. So you were out there trying to get the scoop first. Yeah. And just, just create some stories, right? Get a little bit of uh, notoriety for what you're doing. I mean, how do people actually pick you up? Can you tell me some experiences about that? Early on, a lot of what I tried to make my advantage was like doing the legwork or doing the kind of grunt work that I think more established journalists don't want to do. So actually, the first thing that I ever got published in kind of like a real China outlet at the time, it was called Tea Leaf Nation. And they did a lot of kind of translating interesting stuff from Chinese into English. Mm. There had been kind of a spate of news stories about this dramatic love diary that had been released online by the mistress of a high-level official in China. Mm. And I read all the news stories and they like, you know, <laughs> yeah, they picked out the most salacious little bits of the, you know, diary and they kind of wrote a simple story about it. Like, oh, this is a scandal. I was like, you know, I bet that none of those people actually like read the diary start to finish. It was like 120,000 characters long. Oh, yeah, wow. And, you know, <laughs> if you're a real journalist, you probably don't have time to do that. So I yeah. decided I was going to actually like plow through the entire thing and try to write something more deeply nuanced, really trying to engage with it. And so it actually happened on the day of the first kind of air apocalypse in Beijing. This is January 2013. Mm. When, you know, the first day that it went up to, I forget what level, 800, 900 level pollution. And I just hold up in my apartment and read this entire diary start to finish, 120,000 characters. Oh, wow. And I wrote a story about how it's a kind of funny scandal, but actually it tells us a lot about kind of like gender power dynamics in the workplace. And I sort of wrote a story about that and I submitted it to Tea Leaf Nation and got it published. And that was kind of my MO for a lot at the beginning is like when there's something that requires a lot of grunt work. Maybe it requires travel. Maybe it requires talking to ordinary people. Maybe it requires reading a 120,000 word or character love diary. I'm willing to kind of put in the time and do that and use the Chinese skills in that way to try to get a little bit of an in. Oh, that's fantastic. Wow. Well, that brings up another aspect that maybe we haven't really got into is like about literacy in Chinese. But like, what did you do to build your reading proficiency? I mean, to even get to the point where say, hey, I can read someone's diary, much <laughs> less someone that's 120,000 characters long. It was 
pretty like old school grunt work, self-made flashcards. So I had this very elaborate system that I came up with mostly in my time in Xi'an with colored paper and I'd cut it out and it was like a, a little tiny piece of cardboard that I'd fold in multiple ways such that I could reveal different things about the character to myself. I could either reveal just the pinion or just the English definition <laughs> or, you know, just the character. Really, wow. I, I still have some of them somewhere around here. It, it was one of those things where I'm sure there are like really good methods and the most efficient way to do characters and the most efficient way to do reading and stuff like that. But I think at the end of the day, it is kind of just like, you got to put in the time, you got to put in a lot of grunt work. And so I would just carry those flashcards around with me everywhere. I was on the bus, you know, just kind of <laughs> constantly flipping through these cards. I'd have little scoring systems where I'd, every time I got it right, I'd put a little mark on the left side. Every time I got it wrong, put a mark on the right side. And then if I get five right and one wrong, I had a whole like, <laughs> unnecessarily elaborate system for my homemade <laughs> flashcards. Maybe one of the interesting things is how much different learning Chinese is in a mm -hmm. smartphone era and in a more online era. So obviously 2010, you know, we had the internet, but I wasn't spending all that much time on it and I didn't get a smartphone until 2013. So yeah. there wasn't that kind of like quick and easy way to look everything up. I'm interested kind of in what the trade-offs are there between like, it makes reading a lot easier because you can just highlight a character and you know what it means versus maybe there is some value to like kind of forcing you to like brute force your way through it. Yeah. I've always thought this is that there isn't a lot of value in the time spent just searching through a dictionary for a character, but it's also that ability to quickly look up characters can create an over-reliance on tools to do that. Right. So instead, because it's like, oh, if you struggle one second, it's easy to just, you know, touch. Well, there's the pinyin, right? Sometimes we can create an over-reliance on pinyin. It's a balance, right? Because I remember one time I've seen an app says, you know, click your way to fluency. And I'm like, no, that's <laughs> exactly how it works, you know? But I'm so glad that that is available when we do need it. So we don't have to waste a lot of time just looking up stuff. But it's always a balance. I just remember in my first year in Xi'an carrying around this probably like a two, three inches thick like pocket dictionary in my chest pocket. And every time come into a new character, I have to be like, okay, so what's the radical? How many strokes is the radical? Mm. Go to the radical uh, glossary at the back of the dictionary. Yeah. And then that refers yeah. you. I mean, just incredibly archaic system compared to what I imagine people are doing right now. And but how did you bridge that gap between saying I went for flashcards and now I'm starting to actually read stuff? I guess it was just classes and like forcing myself to do the reading. So I guess the biggest periods of time when I would do a lot of reading, I moved to Beijing after one year in Xi'an, took classes there that involved like reading out of textbooks and stuff like that. That was definitely something. But probably the time when I really started getting much, much better at reading and reading quickly was my first job in Beijing was as a newscaster on a English language TV station. And I still really wanted to learn the Chinese. And so I would take on a lot of like the original Chinese language research myself. I had like assistants mm -hmm. who were supposed to, you know, kind of do it for you, but I'd say, hey, let's do it together. And so every day for many months, I would just pour over Chinese um, news articles about stuff. My show was kind of like an economics show, kind of a funny show. It's called China Price Watch. And every day mm -hmm. it was a new show about what's happening with the prices of things in China, which sounds no. like absolutely the most <laughs> boring possible <laughs> subject matter. We would then make it into kind of like a show about, you know, microeconomics and these different industries yeah. and how policy intersects with how do they control pork prices in China and how do they control vegetable prices. So I kind of just spent, yeah, a lot of time every single day reading articles about vegetable price controls. But you had an assistant reading with you. Is that right? So we had kind of a, a small team where there was like a producer, me, and maybe two like researchers. They were supposed to do all the research in Chinese and then write a script for me in English. And on the other shows on the network, that's what would happen. But I was interested in this stuff and I wanted to learn the Chinese. So I was kind of like, hey, like, you know, I'm going to be my own research assistant too. So I'd say you research assistants, you just find all the interesting Chinese language articles, send them to me and maybe pull out what you think are the most interesting paragraphs or what do you think is mm. kind of the key point of this. And then I'm going to do the whole synthesizing, translating into English, summarizing that kind of thing. So it was definitely me like taking on a lot of unnecessary work. That was not my job, but I really wanted to learn at that point in time. 
Well, you know, I think to me that underscores some important things that I have seen just throughout my life, learning Chinese, and especially when I'm interviewing people with podcasts, you found something that was interesting to you. Plus, you also had your research assistants pull out the most relevant parts, right? Right. And so you were able to focus on the meat. <laughs> right. Didn't have to sift through a whole bunch of chaff, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. We need to put out a program every day. So like every 24 hours is a new cycle. You got to plow through it. You got to make sense of this. I was really motivated wow. during that period of time. That's great. And I always say, it says, motivation can take you really far. Definitely. You know? Even if you're reading at a low level of comprehension, which is difficult, it can be demotivating. But if you're really motivated, you can get through it. So what ended up bringing you back to the United States? And, and also, how did Chinese impact what you're doing now? So the simple answer is love. <laughs> I fell in love with someone <laughs> in, in the United States, my current fiance. I decided you know what? I got to be with this person. I got to get back to California some kind of way. So I started kind of looking for ways to try to like bridge my work. I had just recently gotten the job as a correspondent over there, a foreign correspondent for the Huffington Post. And so I started looking at stories that bridged like China and California through a whole like sort of visa fiasco. I was sort of stranded in, in California for eight months during this period of time. And during that time, yeah, I, I just started realizing that China and California, maybe in 2008 or 2004, these places were pretty far apart and it might be a little bit hard to find the linkages between them. But in this period of time, 2012 to 2018 or so, you had tons of new linkages between California and China. So you know, California is the top destination for Chinese students, top destination for Chinese investment, a lot of Silicon mm -hmm. Valley China, Hollywood China, a lot of interesting stuff. And so I latched onto these as like, this is going to be my ticket home. You know, I'm going to mm -hmm. learn about this stuff. I'm going to write a book about it. And then I'm going to make this like my expertise. And that's basically how it played out. So after a couple of years as a reporter there, I moved back in the spring of 2016. And I started working on kind of any and all projects linking China and California. So I helped bring some like mayors from the Bay Area to China for mm -hmm. sort of investment promotion. I would give Chinese language tours of Stanford to Chinese tourists who were in the area. I started working on this book that eventually became a book called The Trans-Pacific Experiment, How China and California Collaborate and Compete for Our Future. So I found a way to segue my former journalism work into slightly more analytical work, turn it into a book. And then I sort of eventually turned that book into my current job at a think tank. That definitely makes it sound much smoother than it was. It was actually <laughs> very, very difficult. But I can imagine. You yeah, look back, you know, oh, yeah, this was all planned. You know? <laughs> Matt, I'd like to hear from your perspective. How do you see the importance of learning Chinese in the future? I'm a big believer in grassroots diplomacy is maybe a, a more official sounding way to put it. The, the casual way to put it is like make friends with your baan, you know, make friends mm -hmm. with the Chinese people playing Frisbee. <laughs> but I think I loved this stuff back in 2008, 2010, when I first got engaged with it. And I think it's kind of more important than ever now in that like you look at from a very big picture political environment, the technology environment, great power of rivalry, superpower, trade war, all the stuff that you kind of read about in the news. And I think that going forward, we need to not let that be the dominant or, or the only way that the U.S. and China relate to each other. I think one of the great things of the last couple of decades is that it was the, the first time when you had a lot of Chinese and American people kind of like meeting face to face and having those kind of exchanges in a meaningful way. And, you know, I don't believe that the fact that uh, there's Americans studying in China or Chinese people studying in the U.S. is somehow going to like solve great superpower rivalry or something like that. In fact, a lot of times it kind of adds to tensions when people meet each other face to face. <laughs> but I do believe that whether you want the U.S. and China to get along or if you're someone who says, you know, oh, you know, I'm a patriotic American and I want America to, quote unquote, win this, you know, rivalry, whichever side of that you're on, you really need to understand where the other side is coming from. You need to understand what are their motivations? How do they see the world? What do they think is in their interests? How do they perceive you? How do they perceive your actions? All that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. These are some of the most enriching things that I ever did in my life was getting to know, learning Chinese and using it to get to know Chinese people and just kind of like see into their world, share some of mine with them. So what advice would you give to someone who's starting to learn Chinese right now? The most practical piece of advice I could give is to not 
be afraid to learn by imitation. I think for my first year or so there, one of the things that slowed me down was I was very set on like, I don't want to just like copy your sentences. I want to make my own sentences. So I would learn all these new vocab words and I would make my own sentences with them. And I'd go to my tutor and I'd say, hey, are, are my sentences correct? And she'd say, I mean, yeah, like technically they're correct, but like, I wouldn't say it like that. I don't know. I think it was maybe kind of an American or you could call it a Western approach of like, I want to build up my own independent sentences. I don't want to mm -hmm. learn by copying. And it was actually through using Chinese pod, the podcast that I just started literally like listening to conversations so many times, memorizing those entire conversations and just reciting the dialogues to myself. I would walk around Beijing, just like reciting both sides of a dialogue. <laughs> and it was when I finally kind of like surrendered to like, hey, I'm actually just going to memorize exactly how a Chinese person would say this. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to just say it a hundred times. And then that when it comes to like the real life situation where I need to say something like this, it's just going to come out. And so to me, that was a little bit of a things click moment was when I stopped trying to kind of be aggressively like independent in how I spoke Chinese and just said, hey, learn exactly how Chinese people say it, say it a million times, and then you'll be able to make your own sentences with it later on when you understand the patterns and the intonation and all that stuff. So don't be afraid of imitation would be my advice. Good advice from a man who knows. <laughs> <laughs> So Matt, how can people find you if they want to find your book and find out a little bit about you? So the book is called The Trans-Pacific Experiment, How China and California Collaborate and Compete for Our Future. You can just search The Trans-Pacific Experiment. If you're into the same kind of stuff that we've been talking about, the culture smashes, the learning from one another, that kind of stuff, I think the book will be interesting to you. My sort of day-to-day -day work comes out on the think tank website that's called Macro Polo. That's like macro as in macroeconomics, polo as in Marco Polo. If you do uh, Twitter, then you can find me on there at, at Matt Sheehan88. So S-H-E-E-H-A-N-8-8. And we'll put those in the show notes as well. And if I'm a Frisbee player and I want to watch your videos in Chinese, where can I find them on YouTube? <laughs> you can find them on YouTube by finding sort of my account, which it's either Matt Sheehan or Matt Sheehan 88. Or if you can, you know, type in the Chinese characters, they're all under So America Duizhang, like captain of a Frisbee team, Frisbee class. Great. I've always loved Fei Pan, right? You know, it's just flying dish. <laughs> That's frisbee in Chinese. Perfect. Yeah. So, well, great. Well, Matt, I really appreciate you taking the time to share your insights and, and perspective with us. Thank you, Jared. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, voter, scooter rider, marshmallow cooker, Oreo eater, tofu baker, and that one girl named Margaret. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at mannercompanion.com. If you feel like you've got an interesting story to tell about learning Chinese, reach out to us. If we're desperate enough, we just might get you on the podcast. Apologies to John Cena. We just ran out of time. The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself, Jared Turner, and our editor is James Harper with Filter Productions. I'd like to thank our guest, Matt Sheehan, and of course, thanks to my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Paston. See you next time.